On June 7, 1991, in Mountain Grove, Missouri, Jim Shepard and his wife Ethel were looking after their two young grandchildren. Ethel, she's a very overly protective grandmother. Her preference was not to leave them in the house unattended. Daniel, he would run up to the side of the moor when I wasn't even aware that he was there. And it had just scared me terrible. Oh, go back and play with your sister. And so I had sent him back up there and would tell him, don't come back down here now. If you want Grandma to do something, wave at me. I thought, Stacy's on the other side of the swing. Daniel was up in the swing, and I thought they were safe. I was holding the swing back when my grandma was coming. He was going to try to beat the lawnmower. The next thing I remembered, I was standing against against the pole. And I had a hold of the handlebars, and I was trying to raise it up off of him. Oh, my God. Daniel's older brother, Larry, rushed outside to help. I heard Stacy scream, and I seen the uh, Well, you could see bone. I mean, you could see it was just sticking out. I couldn't think of anything on it just other than, dear God, help us. I knew he was still alive. And then I saw the blood begin to squirt. And that's when I knew I had to stop the bleeding. The St. John's ambulance was immediately dispatched. Grandma, he said, you're hurting me. And uh, I kept telling Daniel, Grandma, don't want to hurt you. But we've got to not let that bleed. Grandpa, go away from the ambulance up by the road. Hurry. Oh, God, what they say, Larry? There was just a, a sick feeling just right in the very pit of your gut there that all of the bone and everything had been just chopped and eaten away by the moor blade. I began to pray and ask the Lord to give me strength to keep it shut off and that he would make it. As I pulled into the driveway, I could see the grandmother holding the child. And as I approached, it was obvious that uh, we were dealing with something that was very life-threatening. Glenn, call the bird. Okay. Okay. While paramedic Bubba Shaw began treating the little boy, his partner, Glenn Buckner, radioed for a helicopter. Three, two to base two. Would you please put Hammond's life on in there? Okay. Everything looks all right. Her blouse was blood-soaked, and um, I knew that uh, the child had lost a great deal of blood volume. Okay, I've got the leg. Uh, her mind was so focused on saving that child that uh, it, we literally had to pry her hands free of the child in order to uh, take him from her. Okay, Grandma. Okay, Grandma. Let go of him, Grandma. My fingers was just so tightly locked around his leg that I was trying desperately to turn loose of it, but it just seemed like they wouldn't function properly. Okay. Get out of the jump bag, We're doing everything we can. You just going to have to bear it. consciousness was decreasing rapidly. And his chief complaint at the time was that he was cold. You know, by that time, he was really starting to go into shock. Well, I looked over at the grandma and I said, do you have a dryer in your house? She said, yes. And I said, would you please get four or five towels and put it on high for about four minutes? We're going to warm you up real quick, hero. Let's, uh, let's get a blood pressure cuff and put it around that bag. It was just a sinking feeling inside. I didn't think there was a way in the world that he would live. We got all kinds of equipment on you right now, don't we? You see things that horrify you okay. all the time. You ever been on a helicopter before? Because it's a child. It makes me want to cry. It, uh, it brings out emotions that you try not to let the public or your coworkers see. Okay, we're going to cover you up with some good hot towels. We took the sheets off, all right. but the warm towels, and they were really, really warm. What's Put them on top of him, covered him up, and just like in two minutes, he was no longer cold. His color was improving. But we'd also infused like 400 mils of fluid into him at the same time. That's the helicopter landing right now, okay? Yeah. You're going to be okay. It's a little bit noisy. It's no big deal. It's very hard to, uh, to work on a child that you know may not make it. And the family was there, and they were like, my God, what has just happened? Because it happened so quick, you know. And after the little boy left, that's when it all really started sinking in. 
And I know for a fact that I gave Grandma a hug and thanked her for being so strong. And that when they drove to the hospital, they didn't drive safely and just take their time. A call was placed to Daniel's parents to inform them that their son was being airlifted by lifeline to St. John's Hospital, 65 miles away. There, a trauma team was awaiting his arrival, led by Dr. Rosellen Maestrick. Tell me how this happened. He had lost a significant amount of blood at the scene and a lot of the muscle, so it, it was a very devastating injury for that child. Dr. Maestrick told Daniel's parents, Louise and Dennis Prock, that there was no hope of saving their six-year-old son's leg. It just seemed like I was just in a, in a nightmare. I didn't know for sure if it was even going to... He was even going to die. I didn't really know what to say to him. I was just shocked. My nerves just seemed like they just wanted just to fly out of my body, you know, when that happened. Daniel, we're going to take Daniel's left leg was amputated just below the knee. He was hospitalized for nine days. During his recovery, he was often visited by the paramedics who'd helped him that day. Hi. Hi. Hi, Daniel. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Right, it's good to see you. Every time we went to St. John's, we'd uh, sneak away for five minutes and see Daniel. How's he doing? Glenn and I got you a little good, present. Good. It's a helicopter, just kind of like the one that you flew in. Daniel uh, is so strong, he has the courage of a hundred men. Uh, he's going to be okay. I mean, he lost a limb, but uh, he didn't lose his life. Wow, look at that. If the grandmother had not controlled the bleeding, Daniel would have died before we got there. There's no question in my mind about it. Did they say when he might be able to go home? I really, really feel that what Bubba and I had done was out of instinct and training. That's really good. Get out of here. Okay. And the true heroics belongs to the grandma and the little boy. Can the little boy, Jack? He looks at me and he says, Mom, will I be able to walk again? And I said, sure, you'll be able to walk again. And he said, how am I going to do that? Is God going to grow me another one? And I said, well, I said, well, I certainly believe he could. We're going to get you an artificial one for right now. And he said, OK. Daniel was fitted with an artificial leg. A year has passed. This just hasn't really slowed him down any. If anything, I think it's made him more active. We had gone to Columbia and stopped at the Capitol building. And I said, Daniel, you've got to slow down. Grandma cannot keep up with you going up these steps. Every year, more than 10,000 people are injured in lawnmower accidents. Children should not play away on lawnmowers. You can, you can die. She's got all she can take out of there. Let's oh, he's a loving little guy. Uh, he okay. can get you by the neck and give you a big hug and a kiss and it just, you know, it really gets you to the heart. The real handicap in people comes from how they feel about themselves and if he thinks he can do it, he could do anything he ever wanted to do. Next. He was what you would consider really a cardiac cripple. Uh, the abnormal rhythm of his heart put him at very high risk for sudden death.